So welcome to this uh, dissertation or PhD defense by Johan Ingsson and uh, with the title Grass and Cover Crop for Biogas Production and Climate Change Mitigation, a life cycle perspective. Uh, it's really great to see so many people here. Uh, and for information, the, this session will be recorded. Is that you're aware of that? Uh, I am Björn Wienerås, I'm a professor at the Department of Energy and Technology, and I have been appointed by the faculty to share this session. Uh, to inform you on the procedure, first, you want me to present his thesis for approximately 30 minutes, and then it will be a discussion between the opponent uh, and the respondent until they are that the thesis has been thoroughly evaluated and discussed. Uh, after approximately one and a half hour, we will take a short break so that you can stretch your legs and then we start after approximately 10 minutes and then we continue until you're done. And then after that, we leave the word to the evaluation committee for asking questions. And finally, we also open to the floor if there is any more questions. When all this has been done, then we close this session and the evaluation committee has a post-seminar discussion about the thesis and end up giving a grade and the grades are pass or fail. And that will be done up at the department later on. So the involved people, of course, we have the respondent, Duan Nilsson, that has a master in environmental and water engineering from Uppsala University. And he have made his PhD thesis here or PhD work here at our Department of Energy and Technology. We have the opponent, Professor Paul Börjesson, from the uh, Department of Technology and Society at Lund University. And then we have the evaluation committee with uh, Dr. Niklas Svensson from from the Department of uh, Management and Engineering at Linköping University. We have Professor Monika Odlare uh, from the Division of Sustainable Environment and Construction at Manavalen University in Västerås. And then we have Docent Oskar Englund from the Department of Natural Science, Design and Sustainable Development at uh, Mid-Sweden University in Östersjön. And then as reserve, we have Dr. Priscilla de Moray coming from our department and also working at RAS here in Uppsala. Then we should also introduce the supervisors, which is the main supervisor, Fernando Thompson. Uh, <laughs> as you know, and we have the assisting supervisors, uh, Docent Camilla Tidoke. And the sentence is here. So, so okay. it's your time to shine. Yes, thank you, Dana. And very warm welcome. Yes, right. And thank you all for the appointment. I'm very honored and grateful that I'm going to see the thesis and material and to for questions and uh, very humble to us. Let's move on. Uh, so as Björn said, uh, the title of the visit is Grass and Cover Crops so for Biogas Production and Climate Change Mitigation, a Life Cycle Perspective. And my supervisors are Kalandesh Hanson and Tudorke. Um, so this is the outline for my presentation today. Uh, so I'll start off with some background to the project, and then I will not move on and talk a little bit about the fun and show us some of the results. And also that I will go through, through the uh, major conclusions, and finally I will end the presentation with going through some ideas for future research that we do this year. Um, so if I start off with some background, um, so this figure here uh, shows the average uh, uh, surface temperature, um, and we can really see that this year uh, is. Uh, the, it's a very hot year so far. And it looks like now that this will be actually be the hottest year of recording planet. 
And this climate change is already today causing severe damage and loss and as humans and nature all around the world. And the projected further increase in temperature is expected to worsen this situation and bringing more adverse and irreversible effects. And the one way to mitigate climate change is to phase out fossil uh, fuels uh, with bio-based alternatives. And this is often referred to as the transition from our current fossil economy to the revived economy. And one uh, biofuel with high potential is biogas, which shows relatively low climate impact compared to other fuels. Uh, in Sweden, uh, most of the uh, produced biogas is upgraded to biomethane, uh, which can be used directly in fossil infrastructure to replace natural gas, for example, in the transport sector or uh, for heating and uh, electric electricity generation. Um, the one way to increase uh, biofuel production is to use energy crops, but energy crops preferred by agricultural land, which is a limited resource. But it's really possible to increase agricultural production by using unused potentials within the agricultural landscape. Uh, so, for example, unused and underused agricultural land. And in this type of expansion uh, of agricultural production, uh, grasses and cover crops have been, have been suggested as suitable feedstock for biogas production. And when I'm talking about uh, grasses here, I'm referring to perennial uh, grasses and legumes that are either grown in mixed or in pure stands. And when I'm talking about cover crops, uh, I'm referring to crops that are grown between main crops. And this type of system has different potential for climate change mitigation. Uh, so, for example, it produces uh, biogas, which can be used to substitute. Is better? Okay. Perfect. Um, and so this type of system produces biogas, which can be used to substitute fossil diesel fuel. Um, it can also increase the soil carbon stock and thereby uh, act as a uh, carbon sink to the atmosphere. And gas and carbon crop cultivation has also been shown to bring other uh, benefits to uh, uh, the cropping system. Proper system. So, for example, it, uh, it can reduce nutrient leaching, uh, improve soil structure, and uh, reduce risk for pest attacks, and, there, and thereby uh, reduce the demand for uh, agricultural inputs such as uh, fertilizers, pesticides, and, and fuels for um, uh, operations. Um, but in this transition from fossil fuels to uh, um, biofuels, it's important to study the climate effect. Biofuels, because there are examples uh, where biofuels can show very high climate impact. Uh, and especially, especially important for energy uh, uh, crop based uh, biofuels because uh, the cultivation of the feedstock can bring a uh, high climate impact. Um, so, what determines the climate impact of a crop system? Uh, first, we have some uh, inputs such as uh, chemicals, fertilizer, energy, machinery, and so on. And all these types of inputs come with a climate impact. And then we have some outputs from the system, and how efficient the system is, meaning uh, how much input you need per unit output, will also affect the climate impact. And then we also have emissions that occur within the system from soil processes, such as changes in the soil carbon stock. Uh, we have uh, emissions of soil borne nitrous oxide and methane. And uh, to complicate things a little bit further, these emissions are determined by embedded in uh, management, climate, and environmental conditions, which all vary over time and space. Uh, and these soil uh, emissions or emissions from soil processes and their uh, variation of time and space have been shown very important for the climate impact of cropping systems. Uh, but they are often neglected in portfolio represented in LCA studies, often due to a uh, lack of data. So, this was something that we also wanted to uh, study in this uh, project. And uh, yes, so, uh, so the overall aim of the thesis was to explore climate change mitigation potential of grass and cover crop population and its integration into biogas systems in Sweden. Uh, and I did this using LCA methodology in with agricultural modeling and data from field experiments. 
um, and for the strategic objectives, I'll study the temporal life cycle climate impact of cross cultivation, different fertilizer intensities, and on the different uh, cultivating conditions due to spatial variation. Uh, I'll also look at the climate effect of integrating grass and cover crops and cropping systems for cultivation diversification and, and cover cropping. Uh, and lastly, I will look at the life cycle climate impact for biogas production systems using biomass and grass cultivation and distributed in a landscape and oil seed rice cover crop. And the thesis is based on these four papers. And uh, so the third three papers are published. And the last one is submitted and currently under review. Um, and this video here shows um, an overview of the included papers in the business. So in the first paper, we assess the uh, climate impact, the electrification impact of cross cultivation at uh, five different sites in Sweden. And in the second paper, uh, we expanded the system and studied the climate effects of introducing a cross based biogas system in Uxala municipality and uh, using the fallow land in the region. And in paper three, we assess the environmental effects of cross cultivation in cropping uh, systems, in cultivation, sorry. And in paper four, we assess the climate effect of uh, cover crop cultivation on different management strategies. Uh, including harvesting the cover crop and use the biomass for uh, biogas production. So I'll start off with uh, talking a little bit about the first two papers. Um, so the five sites included in paper one uh, were spread out over the southern parts of Sweden, so from uh, Kungsänger here in Uppsala to Tanisha outside Hamstein south. And the grass was assumed to be cultivated in five year rotations, uh, starting with sowing and rolling the first year, and ending with plowing the last year. And during this uh, rotation, the grass was assumed to be fertilized and cut twice a year. But we simulated this uh, rota grass rotation for six full rotations, which corresponds to 30 years in total. And to do this, uh, we use an aggregate model called the uh, ENDC, which stands for the identification disposition. And in contrast to, uh, uh, for example, simple problem models that have been used in some as before, this type of uh, aggregate system models include different uh, projects that in the cropping system and their interaction between each other. So um, it includes soil uh, crop growth and carbon and nitrogen fluxes and, and the surrounding environment in the same model, and that's a big advantage. Um, and this model was first developed in 1992, but has since then been further developed and branched into different versions of the model. And for the first two papers, we used the version of the DNDC CAND, uh, which has been improved to better fit Canadian conditions. Which includes conditions close to having this And uh, so, what we did was that we, we fed the model with specific soil and crop properties, uh, the weather conditions, and the management scheme. And then, we ran the model and collected data for uh, crop growth, uh, soil carbon balance, and nitrous oxide and leaching emissions, which we use as input to the life cycle assessment. Um, um, for the climate impact assessment, we use the traditional global warming potential metric, uh, which aggregates uh, the distribution from different greenhouse gases into the carbon uh, dioxide equivalent uh, based on how much heat they trapped in the atmosphere of a specific time horizon uh, compared to carbon dioxide. Um, but one problem with this method is that it's a stat metric, uh, metric, so it doesn't include and the timing of the emissions, and therefore it doesn't very well capture um, the kind of effect of temporary carbon storage, mm -hmm. such as uh, storage, carbon storage, and then public soils. Um, so to then include this, we use a dynamic model based on the absolute uh, global temperature change potential. And with this model, we go one step further and we, uh, we um, um, assess the temporary change of the emission and over time. So uh, here's the result for the first paper. And so here we have the climate impact uh, using the global warming potential. 
on the y-axis or, or the step by mass. Um, and on the x-axis, we have different sites. And let's refer to it. So F1 is uh, 140, and F2 is 200 kilogram nitrogen per hectare. And um, we can see from this figure here that the largest climate impact was from the solid nitrous oxide emissions and emissions from fertilizer, uh, manufacturing the fertilizer. And, and we can also see that the uh, the cross cultivation increased the soil carbon stock at all sites, uh, which reduced the climate impact of the system. Uh, and with a higher fertilizer rate, uh, we got a lower climate impact per harvest and biomass. Um, but then we also saw that there was a large variation between sites. So we uh, actually saw that the variation was larger between sites than between the fertilizer rates, which was one of the major conclusions in this paper. And I guess we're on to the second paper. Um, so here, as I said, we expanded the system to study the effect of introducing a grass-based biogas system in the soil municipality and using the travel land in the region. So this uh, figure here shows a map of the soil municipality and all the black markings you can see here uh, represent land that have been uh, reported being on fallow. And plus to be excluded, uh, land parcels smaller than 0 0.5 hectares and the organic soils. And we ended up with a total number of 1,240 land parcels with a total area of 3,006 hectares uh, with varying soil properties and distance to the biogas plant here. Um, and here is shows an overview of the uh, study system. So, in contrast to the first paper, here we started the net effect of the production of the exotic permanent. They took the more compared to business as usual, it's not real. But if you start looking at the gross based biogas system, you can see that it comprises of the subsystem gross cultivation and biomass conversion from biomass to upgraded biogas, and then the use of the digestive as organic yeah, fertilizer and micro wheat cultivation. And this is the most uh, compared to the business as usual scenario, uh, where we had fallow land instead of the cross cultivation, and the production and use of fossil fuel instead of the upgraded uh, biomethane, and the use of uh, synthetic fertilizer instead of the digestate. Uh, and then we also divided the system into different uh, life cycle stages or compartments, as we call it in papers. So we had the land use. Uh, fuel production and soil fertilization compartment. And uh, so the, for example, the net, the climate, the net climate effect of the land use compartment was sort of set with difference between the grass cultivation and the fallow land. And, yes. and here are the results for paper two. Um, so here you can see that we have used the uh, dynamic climate impact assessment model. So we have uh, the temperature response in Kelvin on the y axis, and on the x axis, we have the time in years. And to the left, we have the impact of the cross based biogas. In the middle is the business as usual scenario, and to the right, we have the net effect. So if we start looking at the figure to the left, we can see that for the short term perspective, the Climate impact was dominated by the biomass conversion uh, sub, uh, subsystem. And this was because, and, and uh, over time, uh, the impact on the subsystem leveled out. And this was because the major uh, greenhouse gas emitted from this subsystem was methane, which is a relatively uh, short lived at the time, of course. So, for a long term perspective, the climate impact was dominated by the gross cultivation uh, subsystem. And if we look at the business as usual scenario, we can see that the climate impact was dominated by the use of the fossil fuel. Uh, and if we look at the net effect, we can see that the uh, uh, land use, like cycle stage or compartment, uh, increased the climate impact. And the uh, outer uh, stages, the uh, soil fertilization and fuel production, uh, show the uh, net negative uh, climate impact. And overall, we concluded that introducing this uh, across this biogas system in the southern municipality uh, would double uh, the biogas production in the region and uh, uh, result in a uh, climate change situation. Um, but the results show quite large variation between sites. 
Um, so uh, this figure here shows the global uh, over time impact reduction of the gross based biogas. So if we, as on the y axis, we have the reduction in percent, and on the x axis, we have the amount of land use. So if we used all available land in the region, we ended up with a uh, reduction of 85%. But if we were able to pick the best performing land, we could increase the immediate reduction. So, for example, if we only use 10%, the best 10% of the available land, we could end up with a nuclear reduction of the gross space biogas um, to 95%. So, moving on to the third paper. So, in this paper, we uh, compared three different uh, six year crop rotations. And so we had one rotation including a two year uh, mixed uh, legume grass, and one with two year pure grass, and one rotation without grass. And in this rotation, we had spring wheat, year five, and year six, we had fallow. And, and in contrast to the first two papers, uh, here we use data from a long term field experiment conducted at three different sites in Sweden. Um, and from this field experiment, you take use data for crop growth and changes in soil carbon stock and uh, data for the management scheme. And for eight full uh, rotations, which corresponds to 48 years in total. Um, um, so if we had different types of output in the system in terms of uh, harvest of different crops, uh, we used the serial unit concept, uh, which is developed by uh, German authorities to uh, make agricultural productivity more comparable. Um, and with this concept, each crop gets a specific uh, conversion factor based on its annual seeding value. So you can convert the harvest of a specific crop into serial units. Um, and this concept have, have, has been used in a data before. At uh, first, time in this paper here, we used the CRM to allocate environmental impact uh, to, to different crops in the rotation. But in our study, we used to use the function unit of the whole uh, crop rotation. Uh, yes, and here's the result for uh, paper three. So here we have the climate impact for the zero unit on the y-axis, and on the x-axis we have different stations and the two fertilizer schemes. Um, and this graph here shows the results for the different sites included in the study. So uh, here we saw that the lowest climate impact at all sites for the mixed uh, growth rotation. And we attribute this to a higher efficiency within this treatment in terms of amount of agricultural inputs per zero unit output. And for the lower uh, fertilization, fertilization scheme, we saw that uh, inclusion of growth in the rotation increased the yields of the other crops in the rotation uh, compared to the uh, low growth rotation there. Uh, but we didn't see the same effects for the high uh, fertilization scheme. Yes, and paper four, uh, we assessed the climate effect of cover crop cultivation with different management schemes. So here we had uh, three alternative uh, scenarios, which was compared to a reference scenario, where we assumed that there were no cover crop cultivated between the main crops in rotation. Uh, and the alternative scenario comprised the incorporation scenario, where we assumed that the uh, the cover crop was left unharvested over winter and then plowed down in the soil in the spring. And then we had the mowing scenario where we assumed that uh, the above ground biomass was harvested. And the uprooting scenario where the above ground and parts of the below ground was harvested. And both in the mowing and uprooting scenario, and the biomass was transported to a biogas plant where it was used to uh, produce upgraded uh, biomethane, the biogas, and to be used in to substitute fossil fuel still in the transport sector. And the produced digest state was assumed to be transported back to the uh, field and used as organic yeah, fertilizer in the subsequent process. And for this uh, paper here, we used data from a long term field experiment conducted in Sweden. And uh, where all the seed radish have been cultivated uh, as a uh, protocol. 
And to assess the photocarbon effect here, we use the sort of carbon model ICM, where we model the effect of uh, the crop crop combination, but also the application of the digest state. And then we use an empirical uh, method to assess the nitrous oxide emissions based on mixture data from uh, nitrous oxide emission from oxid radish as a color crop in southern Scandinavia. And here are the results for um, paper four. So on the y-axis, we have a time impact per hectare, and on the x-axis, we have the different scenarios, alternative scenarios. And the graph the left shows the impact of the land use. And in the middle, we have the impact from the fuel production and the substitute, so the biogas production and the substitution of the fuel. And to the right, we have the total effect. Um, so if we start with comparing the recuperation scenario where the um, the was left unharvested with the more hunting scenario and where the carbon crop was harvested. Uh, we can see that uh, harvesting the carbon crop reduced the soil carbon effect. You can see the gray bars here, so the lower, uh, lower soil carbon substation with the harvest of the crop. We had higher uh, emissions from uh, field operations. Then we also have some emissions from producing the biogas. Uh, um, and uh, we also saw that harvesting the carbon crop reduced uh, some nitrous oxide emissions, green uh, bars here, and also improved the nitrogen balancing systems. We didn't have to use as much synthetic fertilizer when the uh, carbon crop was harvested. Uh, but the most significant result or impact here was that we could produce biogas, which could be used to substitute fossil fuel cell. We have a large net uh, negative tramping effect here. So, in total, we concluded that harvesting and uh, the crop crop uh, increased the mitigation potential of uh, carbon cultivation. Yes, so moving on to the conclusions. Um, so, here I try to boil down some of the conclusions to a couple of bullet points. Uh, so first of all, uh, the thesis shows that uh, using these unused potentials in the agricultural landscape for cover crop and grass cultivation uh, could be used to uh, increase um, domestic bioenergy production and mitigate climate change. So we saw that when we introduced uh, a grass-based biogas system into the southern municipality, uh, we doubled the biogas production in the region and reduced the climate impact uh, and improved soil quality by increasing the soil carbon stocks. Uh, in addition, we saw that um, uh, the mitigation potential of carbon crop cultivation was substantially improved when the carbon crop was harvested for, and used for feedstock as in biogas production. Um, we also saw that uh, uh, quite large spatial variation, um, so large variation in climate impact between sites. And in fact, the influence of soil properties and weather conditions was more important than the fertilizer rate for the climate impact of cross cultivation. And here we saw that so much as oxide conditions and changes in the carbon stock had high influence in this uh, uh, variation between sites. Uh, and the uh, combination of LCA and the animal ecosystem model with the MDC, uh, which we successfully used in paper one and paper two, uh, could also be used to design uh, biomass production schemes in other regions and could be used as a strategic tool uh, to support land use planning for local energy production. And uh, we saw that the grass and carbon crop cultivation increased the net. Um, the net carbon stocks and higher fertilizer rate uh, resulted in a higher soil carbon stock, but it also elevated emissions associated with fertilized production and utilization, which uh, to some extent offset the mitigation potential of the uh, uh, soil carbon sequestration. And finally, we saw the conclusion of crops and crop rotation increased the yields of the other crops in rotation. Uh, which led to a reduced climate impact of the system. And this was particularly evident for the rotation, including across the U mixture with a lower fertilizer rate. Yes. 
and moving on uh, to the ideas of future research. Uh, so I think future research should focus on improving the representation of story processes and of the LCA. Uh, so the models that are used here are based on the current uh, understanding of how these processes and the uh, underlying mechanisms, how they work. Uh, but there still exists large knowledge gaps here, I would say. Uh, and to improve these models and to reduce uncertainty of the results, we need more basic research on, how, on these uh, make, make underlying mechanisms. And so especially important, I think, by get systems is the use of the by get state as uh, as application on fields as uh, again fertilizer because currently uh, we're lacking reliable data of, of um, how this um, uh, application of the get state uh, effect is on carbon and uh, for this case I assume that the biomass was used to buy gas production. But I think it would also be interesting to uh, uh, look at alternative biomass utilization areas. And I think one of the things here is to uh, use the biomass in normal bio refinery platforms where different fractions of the biomass can be extracted um, and used to different uh, areas. So, for example, it could be uh, that you can extract high quality protein from grass and chemical biomass, which can be used for. Seed in more gastric animals, but also maybe also for food for humans. That would be interesting to say. Um, and um, LCA is becoming more and more uh, popular among, among uh, policymakers, both in the private and public sector. Um, but the method have still has some drawbacks, and some of which I've been talking about here. Uh, other things are, for example, like, uh, indicators for important uh, environmental impacts is still lacking. For example, I would say that we don't have a good indicator for biodiversity impact because on soil health. This needs to be further improved. Um, and uh, and the has also been uh, criticized for being too focused on biomass provisioning, but uh, not uh, including other. Um, other uh, benefits of agriculture, such as other ecosystem services. So I think we should also um, put that put into uh, include this in the LC methodology. These are some of the things that I'm hoping to continue to work on and later on. But that was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. So now we invite up also the very song to give the discussion. Speak from stand up. Up to your point. Yes. Yeah. So I I can't do my head with the top here. <laughs> uh, oh. No, I think this is this is okay. Um well, have to tell me if you don't hear me. So, focus on me. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you so much for the invitation to be the opponent here today. Yeah, it has been a privilege to read your thesis, and I have done it very much during the last uh, days here. Uh, and uh, I also want to congratulate you to, to a very Good, well written, comprehensive, interesting thesis. And uh, so I really enjoyed it, really, and I have learned a lot. And um, as in all, regarding all good thesis, you come up with several interesting questions and thoughts. And so I hope we can have a good discussion here and, and, uh, uh, about your work. And you did a very good presentation also, I would say. Yeah, so so we have a very good overview of what you have been doing during this these years. Yeah. Um okay, so I have a mix questions, uh, some more general, some more maybe specific, and I will jump between the papers. So you know my structure, traditional <laughs> structure. <laughs> uh, and we continue until we feel that. 
I'm going to to discuss more here and leave the floor to the moderation afterwards. Yeah, but the first thing I, I, I was thinking about when I read this is um, I, I really like the combination that you work with uh, field experiments and um, also combine this with uh, agro ecosystem models and combine with MCA. Uh, I think it's uh, innovative and we really need more those more broad uh, approaches and, and uh, so I really like that. So my question is how did you start thinking in this how, how to use this in different combinations? Was it due to that you know that we have uh, several long-term field trials that that were around and, and we can use them in this or was that the starting point or was the starting point that we you wanted to look into grass or permanent crop cultivation in Asian uh, strategies? Yeah, so, so what what was the first thing that you yeah, I would say that um, uh, the first thing was because the this department we have worked quite much with the, the dynamic effect of the climate impact. Mm -hmm. And then the additional thing or the next thing what we wanted to do was to also include that spatial variation between sites. And, uh, and that's why we started looking at the use of system models. And, uh, and then, um, yeah, and then um, um, we thought that it would be a nice idea to, to include it uh, across the biogas because. It is some unused potential, and it has been talking a lot about this type of system for a long time. It would be nice to integrate this in the sketch work. Uh, so that's why we started using that with system model. And why we used the long term field experiment was to, because we used the um, system model in the first papers, but then we also wanted to see, uh, use the real data, the measure data, and see how, how that uh, differed. And, Mm -hmm. Okay, so so it was the uh, modeling and that comes first, and and, and then you yeah. yeah yeah. So do we have a lot more uh, interesting data from long term field experiments that you could use more or, or yeah. to use in other studies? Yeah, I would say so. Um, not really into that database, but I know that there are several uh, to extend that the SMU is uh, in charge of. Mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. so I think it's relevant to there. And also to um, improve the models that we have, uh, also be uh, using the long term field experiments to improve the models. Mm -hmm. It's also be interesting to refer into that. Yeah. And you know, I think those need more long term experiments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, then I then I mark with this question that was one of my most questions, but I, I ask it now because then, then I was thinking about uh, this uh, DMEC uh, model uh, and um, and you use this Canadian version yeah. or adapted to, to Canadian conditions. Um, couldn't that be a future work for you to do a Swedish version, or is it, is it better for you to do that? Or? I think it'd be, it need to be like high qualified to a uh, program, we need a lot of knowledge for the program. Okay. There's this program we can see in C++, mm -hmm. quite, I don't know how to do that. Okay. <laughs> but maybe yeah. I can learn. Yeah, but you can find some other yeah. But I think with the, the first paper we collaborated with the current developers of the Canadian version. Mm -hmm. And I guess we collaborated with those guys in the actual That was the Swedish version. Mm -hmm. But I guess that's based on that you have also this uh, field experiments and, and you yeah. can validate them. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. yeah. So, so that's another good way to use all, all the work yeah. we have done in, in this uh, field trials. Yeah, definitely. Right. Uh, yeah. 
I I find your findings very interesting, and I think it's really valuable for policy making and and all that that's going on now regarding carbon farming and carbon credit schemes and, and all that. It's so much going on in the field. I think that this kind of, of knowledge and findings and results should really uh, be taken care of in this development. But we will come back mm -hmm. to that. Uh, but I will start asking if you, what was the most surprising findings that you have thought about to avoid? We found this is well. Uh, this was interesting. Well, the first thing I could think of is in the last paper where we uh, included the nitrogen balance in the cover crop cultivation with the soils. There we found that um, um, when you actually when we included the effect of that and you also store in the soil, you have soil concentration that with the cover crop cultivation you actually needed. To what we start with as a number, if you need to add additional nitrogen. And I didn't have a clue really about that before I could read this. Um, there are probably other things as well. Mm -hmm. um, you have already uh, shown your conclusions here. Um, but I will then ask if you are presenting this once again for policymakers, how you should use arable land or fallow land or, or catch crops in the most efficient way uh, from a climate perspective. How should you steer or how, what kind of system that you really should promote? So, so what yeah. would your recommendation be? Um, you mean uh, cross based biogas or both? Oh, <laughs> I would think no, but it cross based biogas or all the system should yeah. just incorporate biomass, or should we use biogas, or should we yeah. also use cash crops? And how should yeah, uh, the we, system be designed? Yeah, uh, I think it would, we need to increase the biomethane production. Speaking, but also more importantly, in the European perspective, um, to not be so dependent on natural gas and also in the climate as well. But in that, I think we should try to uh, increase where we agree that there is a climate change mitigation potential. And I think for both these systems, uh, where you have uh, use uh, fallow land to use uh, grass and then biogas, Effect uh, and also uh, cover crop cultivation, but I know that you get some subsidies right for, for cultivating cover crops. So maybe that's um, uh, maybe it's easier to convince farmers to do cover crop cultivation than cross cultivation right now at least. Uh, but if you could also get subsidies, more subsidies for cultivating uh, crops on these uh, unused plants, I guess that would also be a good change to increase the, the biogas production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Do you hear me? Is it, is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if I say that if we just go for a soil carbon sequestration, um, uh, I, I think when I read this, and depending on how you do it, if you use fertilizers and so on, it could be quite an um, efficient, inefficient way. Right? Do you agree? Uh, yeah, I think the main mitigation potential is to uh, to reduce biogas. Yeah. 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 One of the last uh, slides you show the bars where you show the net results for yeah. catch crops. Mm -hmm. it, it was really obvious yeah. that the main effect is from. from Biogas production, but also from soil emissions that you can have uh, yeah, improvements if you harvest the, the biomass. Yeah. Also, I think that's I think that's the main 
really important thing to take into account when you design problem credit schemes or so, yeah. how to include this nitrous oxide dimension. Yeah. What will the net effect be actually? Because I, I think you have shown that that could be not only you, you refer to other papers also saying that it could be even worse if you, if you do it in the wrong way because the nitrous oxide emission will increase so much. So uh, it will not be compensated by the on increased carbon storage. Mm -hmm. Or? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then you also have the dynamic effect that uh, when you, for example, when you introduce cross population at the site with low uh, initial soil carbon content, you increase the soil carbon content in the beginning and then it's level over time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can sequester the carbon rather in the same soil. Um, but if you're going to use uh, a fertilizer to increase the soil carbon storage, you have to continue to use the nitrogen for the fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And then you do you still have the high nitrous oxide emissions, but you don't have as high uh, soil carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. And then we also saw that in, in the first two papers that the sequestration potential was uh, higher in the beginning and lower towards the end. Yeah. No, I really like you. You have a good uh, figure about that. Uh, the soil carbon cost is that out nitrous oxide emissions continue to And it's a bit 10 times higher of sequestration during the first 10 years. Yeah. So, so I think that's. Uh, do, do you think that are you into this discussion about how to design carbon credits for schemes or certification? Or uh, so? Not to me, but I've heard about it. Yeah. Do I discuss this? And then I was, we are, we are uh, no. both that and also the issue of nitrous oxide. Um, and I not that I know of. Um, actually, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it would be hidden for it's very important. Yeah. 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 So uh, I think your thesis could be. Uh, Really, an important input to that. Mm -hmm. so, so, we should try to discuss with policymakers also. Yeah. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, we were talking about this DMDC model and, and how how did you come around that model? Why, why did you make that specific model? And as I, as I said before, uh, we wanted to include spatial variation in this. Mm -hmm. That requires a lot of data. And also, when you do the dynamic mode and set up the size of the you for a dynamic uh, resolution. But if you also want to include the spatial resolution, you also add that. Mm -hmm. And then it requires a lot of data. And the best way to go about that is to use models. Uh, so that we decided to use this ecosystem model because they have you model the soil carbon and nitrous oxide in the same model, so you include the interaction between the changes in soil carbon stock and the nitrous oxide emissions, mm. uh, which you don't do when you use the models that only when you model the soil carbon change, uh, the soil like the model, for example. Mm -hmm. And while we uh, specifically chose that model, I think it was Dini was uh, a colleague who had used it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so we got in contact. And then I also come in contact with uh, the different developers. And I think that was a big advantage because these models are quite complex. Um, so uh, it would be, have been very difficult for me to uh, do the first two papers without them helping me, I would say. Um, but I, there are a lot of other similar models like the Century model and the Bates model, for example, uh, which are frequently used. But I think they are parallel uh, and quite light. Um, so um, it would be all really interesting to, to um, make a uh, review so we compare these types of models to see how they differ. Will you do that? Um, maybe I'm not the right person to do it. Okay. 
Um, because again, it's despite a lot of modeling. Yeah. But we are actually been talking about maybe using a central model or another study. Um, it's not a lot of it's quite with that. Um, so I think that's good when you do not see not to be really expert in those models, but you can if you do comments, you can collaborate with some of those expert in that model yeah. and you can add on the CA parts. Yeah. I think that's very valuable. Yeah. So you need to find some in person to yeah. go on there. Or spend some time yeah. learning more. <laughs> yeah. But you didn't use this model in the cross paper. No, no. Why? Uh, well, but again, it took a lot of time to set up the model for the first two studies. And for the um, uh, second paper, we wanted to, to add on the, the dimension, the measure data that we used to use the, the measure data from the material experiments. And for the last paper, uh, we only wanted to like this the boundaries between the main crops and crop rotations, quite like a short um, uh, system. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that type of studies, I don't think uh, uh, I this is one that would be the most convenient. Uh, so there we try to use more traditional methods. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, you you um, compare also. Let's say you you have this uh, rochette. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, that was also Canadian. Adaptive. Yeah. Yeah. On the same department. Yeah. yeah. And then you have this from IPCC. Yeah. And I I thought that was really good that you. Think Compare them and look into differences. Yeah. So, uh, so, did you feel that it was huge differences between them, or was it reasonable? It's quite huge difference, I would say, but yeah. they kind of follow the same pattern mm -hmm. um, that you get higher uh, emissions from more um, fine texture soils, like clay soils, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but they are. In, uh, the Rochette model is uh, an empirical model, and uh, so they have used a lot of data and, and uh, adapted like that, some kind of uh, statistical model to, uh, to that data. Uh, so, so then um, we calculate the uh, oxidation based on the sand content, I think, and the pH and the precipitation, uh, maybe the temperature as well. Um, and on the, the, in the C model, you have or properties of the soil, like uh, visiting the uh, point and fuel capacity and so on. And then they use that information to, to model uh, the, one of the processes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the DNC is more advanced and more uh, complex, uh, but sometimes it's better to use the thicker. Um, but I mean, it's not maybe a uh, because if I compare them in the first paper, it would be interesting to, to compare them for maybe a larger set of different soils. I think then they might be more similar than they would be. You have discussed that in, in your thesis also, there's this huge variation in hydrous side emissions, mm -hmm. also within the field, mm -hmm. uh, and all the temporal. Differences or variations. Mm -hmm. so, so, and you you mentioned that we need more knowledge, of course, about that. <clears throat> but we never had a trust world model covering this huge inherent variation that we actually have. Is this a, how should we go around this huge inherent variation? Yeah, no. but first of all, that's that we need to know more about the mechanisms behind it. Uh, so I think that's the starting point, maybe. And then we want to always be uh, in the up and uh, improve the models with uh, maybe we can use AI or something to make it better uh, make these models more smooth and improve the mm -hmm. Um <coughs> But as I say, they, 
compare a lot between the short distances between the same series. But the same goes actually for the column type as well. It's quite similar to all types of solid particles. They are very, they can vary a lot in the same series as well. And dependent on a lot of different uh, properties. Um, so, but that's also a question of how how low spatial resolution or how high, how high spatial spatial resolution you want to go and how important to actually see these resistances between the resilience and the level of the resistance. Right now, we we with IPCC model, uh, we have quite low resolution. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that can be true, but maybe be perfect. Um, it, it all works. Mm. And do we need to do much more measurements? And yeah, looking into levels of well, yeah, to subside the copper right side of that can be more so various. Or yeah, if it's realistic to do, you need to do very much more, maybe. Yeah, no, but I think. Maybe maybe could be like the yeah, important mechanism of this thing that we like how we so I think we can all wish it's pretty good. But I think you always ask for a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um serial units. <laughs> You you expressed a little bit about the uh, background or, or yes, you use that as a function using it. Um so um is it valid to, to, to use it or do you see what, what benefits do you see from it and what kind of drawbacks maybe or yeah I think if you were if you want to uh, include uh, different Functions of different outputs, and especially for this type of computation where we have graphs and we have serials, and how can we add them to? So, weight would be a math would be a good function uh, to pair of the same. Mm -hmm. So, then I think serial is better, but if I've done that later again, I think I would add also maybe a suit uh, unit or something so we can have uh, um, several functions um, uh, with I would uh, solve this for a particular short, uh, short sincere uh, answer. Mm -hmm. Why? Why food? Uh, or by others. LD could also be one, of course. Yeah. Um, no, but uh, I think that uh, if, but I think that maybe a bit out of the uh, scope here, but uh, if you want to, uh, and improve the system gain of the agricultural system or the system we also need to to reduce uh, uh, how we consume space, for example, and uh, how we uh, why we chose the field unit and it's based on the annual zero value. Um, we um, we base that on that uh, most of the cereal that is used that produces vegan and the bulk that is used is used for animal feed. Uh, but in the future scenario, maybe maybe more will be used for food or power and that was exactly the answer I was getting at. <laughs> I don't think it's out of the scope scope and, and I think that's uh, because I, I was also thinking about this feeding value if we are supposed to reduce meat consumption mm -hmm. and so maybe have food or bioenergy or biogas mm -hmm. kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that the thing that you can work on later on to develop a very good new function of units taking in this yeah. multi output? Yeah. yeah. You're thinking about it? Uh, not that much, but I think it would be, uh, for example, when we talk about the uh, production of the European uh, European Commission's uh, LCA framework, uh, to be uh, different uh, sectors uh, to start to use. Mm -hmm. So, the food or the uh, sector is one sector, it could be a problem with that. 
functional repair, and then you want to also include, I think it's important to include um, the effect of different crop, how, how uh, different crops in rotation with each other. Then you need some kind of uh, location method, perhaps, mm -hmm. or, or include the whole, but it's not very convenient to use the CRU, perhaps, and communicate. Uh, and then one of the methods would really help. But, mm -hmm. uh, but it is still the best. Yeah, I think you mentioned also in the thesis that, uh, that this going on, this work going on with, with this bio refining concept that can use cross for protein yeah. extraction and then biogas biogas production. And you, you can use that as food, mm -hmm. food also. And, um, so, so okay, so I think that's that's an interesting field to be mm -hmm. deeper into. Yeah. Um, and then data. Uh, but in the first paper, you use this uh, and then stood. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to fertilizer production, everything. Yeah. So why did you? Didn't use I think the same uh, yeah. data source or why did you yeah, use I, it? I think in the last papers that we want to do more traditional case, I think that also includes say uh, usually the traditional data that I kind of mm -hmm. and I think I don't remember exactly now, but I think Bento is uh is you know what about uh, best practice. Uh, so I think it's a slower kind of impact mm -hmm. in the end of the time. Uh, so, uh, maybe it's depends on the drive, but I think it might be better to, if you want to do like more general or say something, traditional say something, I think it should be better to use the data. Because I think it was in paper one you show that. There is quite significant emissions from uh, from fertilizer, uh, nitrogen fertilizer production mm -hmm. when it comes to nitrogen subside emissions. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I that was really painful several years ago to to implement some cleaning equipment or mm -hmm. or so. so so that was my question. Is the best available technology here, or is it average production, or is it Western Europe production, or is it global production? Because I think it could the mission yeah. could differ quite much yeah. depending on, on the technologies that we yeah. have. And with Andrew, I think it's the best thing. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, Yeah. I, I guess it could be, it can be that impact could be lower, uh, but I think also right that uh, if you can reduce the environmental impact of uh, production of fertilizer to use uh, renewable energy and so on, that you can, uh, or it's more difficult to uh, reduce the variation from using the. Mm. Yeah, but but even though you it's has some impact, you didn't do a lot of sensitivity analysis of the production of the and no of the that's fine. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. 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 Variation of the size and time. I guess we can also use uh, added some kind of diversity. Okay, two more detailed questions regarding the methods and approaches. It's uh, you change also the time perspective, uh, 30 years to 100 years, mm -hmm. between the 
from you, Mr. Why was it special reason? Uh, I think it's better to use silo. Like, especially when you want to, because as I said, the canvas is not so so carbon. It's not very very clean actually. It's very very sure at this kind of thing. But if you want to have a longer time perspective, it's better because you have species with like a uh, medium or an average of species. So it's 30 years and years. So I mean, again, I think I need to Yeah, so our recommendation is to go for yeah. another yes. Yeah. Uh, and also the that it be the detail question it, it was uh, when it comes to biogas, you you assume that it is each cell yeah. and not petrol. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh how's that? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Uh I think we well, uh, maybe that's uh, an answer perhaps, but I think we wanted to replace uh the idea was to replace um, uh you will see the heavy transport. Um, mm. In this case, we'll come back and back. Mm. I think that was uh, the thinking behind this. Mm. No, I think it's good. It's uh, And also, I think you have a reduction of, of the benefits since you have this taking into account the commercial efficiency in the end. Uh, and and uh, so, so you don't overestimate the, the uh, substitution benefit. Mm -hmm. I guess so. Yeah. It was a little bit lower when you replaced these, yeah. and, and I think that's the space is not products. Yeah, the agent when I got to the small views, it's no car wheels. So, if you use it for personal car, it will be even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I was thinking about the um, figure 19. I don't know if you showed that in the presentation in, in the uh, page 65. I don't think you should. No, no, I don't know if you have. I don't have a thesis, but some of you. Um, no, I, I was thinking we could just use that uh, other one um, because I think it's really interesting that where you show in this case it's paper four, yeah, it's, it's the catch crops. Um, and you have this, uh, we can see from the uh, Changes in, in soil and carbon that you have um, a higher level in, in uh, integration and then moving and then uprooting. And I was thinking about could you just discuss a little bit here, but you were talking about the priming effect yeah. in previous papers that if you incorporate fresh biomass into the soil, then you can increase the fixation of organic material, and then you can even much more important. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that taken into account here? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, so the, the priming is because you know, with on the measure data in actually figure 18, it's given. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about yeah. so we had one uh, in, or one um, treatment there mm -hmm. where we had uh, uh, we had lower, uh, we had a higher um, position of the uh, sodium uh, storage. 
that can start in with a mix uh, class. Other ones you have lower reduction in the cross potential and the new cross. So you can use it out as something else. Um, so, and we didn't have any, any good explanation why that happened. Mm -hmm. But when you see uh, unexpected results, so it's hard to have the studies, they also refer to this priming effect yeah. that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, we, we can have a um, different situation, but it's not included in the uh, modeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, our primary effect is not something that, that I interpret so it's not something that and that you normally see, but it can be like um, more than uh, exams from the actual forms. It's not motivated to try to include that in the yeah, in the models. yeah. But also with the primary effects, it can, um, as I understand it, it's the mechanisms behind the primary effect is not very well understood. Exactly what's, what's happening, and you also be uh, varying effects. Um, uh, but yeah, that's, that's something, something that could be included in these sort of common models. But uh, yeah, I think that would take some sort of more effort. Mm -hmm. And how about the uh, carbon nitrogen ratio in the environment? Is that important in the time? Priming effect also. Uh, okay, a little dependence maybe on the microbes in the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it was a spit, there are microbes that would be more than a bit easier to get stored, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but um, as I think that would, would have an effect, but I'm not really sure exactly how it would affect the information. Um, and then I was thinking about, I'm not clear about, you have the two options, moving and uprooting. Uh, do you do that in two different uh, field operations? Or can, could you harvest both the fields and the yeah. biomass in the same? And the idea was, um, because the oil field vanished, uh, it has tap roots. Yeah. And when you grow it as a uh, cover crop, usually it doesn't get that deep into the soil. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to use some kind of, um, uh, like the harvest that is used for areas or for beets. Yeah. So we can uproot the plants um, with these tap roots and then uh, you can get yeah, picking up the soils. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you, don't, you do that and you can also. Yeah. Or was the above from yeah, exactly the same leaves for yeah. in the same time. Yeah. So you don't need to have two separate no, no, operations. Yeah, no. the idea was. And then I was thinking about this because this means uh, additional soil tillage. And when you do this rooting and, and is that affecting the deposition or that, that you can have an extra priming effect from, from that? Um, Compare with if you just have this moving, then you don't take up the roots. Yeah. But I don't know how do you mean you that you need the extra tillage? Yeah, it's like uh, not like blowing, but, but I mean, it's. Uh, it will uh, stay up. Yeah, and, and uh, activate the microbes. Yeah. Yeah, and that's not included here. Um, but I, yeah, I guess that's what so it could have an effect. Um, Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay, and then I'm coming to the unification with yeah. yeah, yeah. And that you mentioned that also because that's we don't have a specific one when it comes to digestive. Oh. You use that for manual. Yeah. And and I was thinking, could you could you have some idea how it could be? Different if we have, if we really could, could investigate and see uh, how it is for yeah. ideas to be, how it is for Yeah, I think 
and uh, it would be a bit higher for I guess states. I talked to some people and I, I heard that some recommend that some of the guest state that you should use the civil sludge uh, for the education coefficient. That's a bit higher than for manure. Um, but we use the manure coefficient because yeah, we, we don't know and if we want to make that more of a conservative assumption there, so we use the but my guess would be that there's some difference between the two. Um, so what level of the coefficient is that? Uh, so what what does that mean in that that um so, so if you I was thinking if, if you have a it, yes, it, it, it it's should contain a high degree of quite stable yeah. problem mm. that that we not because that's right. Or, yeah. Yeah. So, so it also depends on the what substrate we use in the, the bias collection. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we use manure as the substrate, it would be definitely uh, more recalcitrant or more difficult to, to decompose. It, so, then, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Or uh, then manure. Yeah. yeah. So, so, what will the net effect be? Uh, will the differences between the, the three different uh, commissions here or, or this cooperation moving upward, will it decrease the differences if we? Uh, it, yeah, it will be. Um, uh, so the upward will be lower, but the, the difference will be um, this. It would be a large difference between the incorporation would be the same, of course, mm -hmm. but the mowing will be a bit lower mm -hmm. and the uh, upload would be uh, and lower. But then you have more, I guess, that is trying to solve the best for us to go down the cost of the Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's, um, I was thinking it could be the opposite, but then it's. Um, I'm just guessing, so I have no idea, but, but I, I think it's since we don't have this communication back for the world, mm -hmm. it's sounds or, or seems to be very important to it. Yeah. Well, did you say that you have to a higher communication coefficient is higher, mm -hmm. but then you have the opposite, mm -hmm. so then you're great. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. No, but I think it's. Um, the, the different explanations and the things that you've discussed in the previous paper, I, I was thinking that it was quite relevant with these yeah. uh, differences here. Um, okay, but I think once again, if you just look in, into this graph, uh, you, you say that we should absolutely leave the uh, environments, we should break it in soil because that is the highest solvent or carbon sequestration. Uh, and, and I'm thinking that this, a lot of this uh, discussion today about soil carbon credits and so have this perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I was meaning in the beginning. And, and you have shown very clearly now that we also need to see if we can expand the system and also mm -hmm. use the biomass mm -hmm. and uh, downstream positive methods, so it's quite important mm -hmm. to take into account. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I, I think we should talk a little bit also about um, the, the, the sequestration potential in different kinds of soils, and, and uh, I think that's also extremely interesting. And, um, I refer to, to the first paper with the six different um, places, or five, sorry. Um, and the figure 15 on page 60. Um, and I think that combination that you really show the importance of the play component, uh, with the, the combination also with the, the soil component. So, 
you take you need to take into account both the if you have the five points, that's really good because you can store more on cover. Mm -hmm. But then you will also eventually um, come up with a new state state you know, where the client will the level of the time. Or so how can you explain a little bit? I, I'm thinking about Kung Sengen, the 57% play and 6% 6 uh, uh, soil cover. It's quite high. Mm -hmm. And then we have Lama, it's 3% play and 2% uh, soil cover. So how can you more explain the, the, the importance of those two? Um, the take off the process of the uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the is the uh, initial state and content. Yeah, and on the uh, prior to this, the substation potential. And then uh, the different clients here show represent uh, the key content. Mm -hmm. um, so that was basically what you exactly. said. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And what was the question? Sorry. No, I, my question is how how can you use this in practice? I'm, I'm now I'm back to cover farming again. Yeah. <laughs> Because you have been talking about that, if we have better knowledge, the spatial uh, knowledge about uh, different fields, and I, and then you can optimize. Mm -hmm. You can steer where which kind of fields uh, have the biggest potential mm -hmm. based on both the plate content and the yeah. initial soil content. Yes, that's um, something that's also important to uh, if we are discussing the. The gross effect or the net effect. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the gross effect mm -hmm. uh, of the interaction of gross. But from a um, change perspective, it's also important to look at the net effect. Um, so uh, and actually I think in paper two that if I look at the gross effect, that's uh, actually weaker. Oh, but um uh, when you look at the it, it is quite large variation between sites. Mm -hmm. Some uh, sites uh, sequester low carbon, mm -hmm. and some sites lose low carbon. Mm -hmm. But if you look at net effects, the difference in the sequestration between the cost of the and the fallow land, mm -hmm. there's a, a smaller difference between uh, um, the two sites. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is also important to include if. If we reduce uh, the loss of some carbon, that would also have a climate effect. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important to know uh, or to be able to like, assess the climate effect, it's important to know what ultimate loss effect mm -hmm. um, and how it's varied over different sites. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's also very important to, to include that we might lose more carbon if we don't do things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but I think as a starting point, you need to take into account the gross yeah. effect mm -hmm. first, and, and then you can how you should use this potentially in the best way to minimize mm -hmm. um, to to so the net effect would be as good as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, but. Uh, so it's also if we don't, for example, grow gas in this land, what we do we do instead? Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. even if uh, we don't have a large so carbon effect for growing gas in this land, not growing gas we have might reduce the soil carbon source even more. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, I think it's also important to include this in carbon credit schemes. So. Yeah. Yeah, those like for the systems. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's important to, to include both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how can you do that in practice? Do you think that would be when you develop once again credit 
Yeah, I've got the carbon credit scheme, so yeah. because that's a big issue. How, yeah. how should you measure or how could you yeah. calculate the, how much carbon you actually can store? And I guess you must come up with some input data that, that could be yeah. valuable and give some direction. Yeah, no, no, but I think that's also maybe a problem with the carbon credit. Schemes in uh, that this is not uh, permanent storage mm -hmm. and uh, it's important to keep Netflix. Um, so, I think it is, it's the idea is to use it for uh, common concentration to substitute uh, also fuel a little bit issue from the same uh, carbon dioxide. I think that's a very good idea actually. Mm -hmm. um, and a little bit related to that also, because I think it's really good you have you have used different functional units also. You've expressed the uh, green gas mitigation uh, based on the biomass, uh, amount of biomass, and then also for hectare. Mm -hmm. um, or power, maybe you biogas in you use it for biogas production. So how how do you see once again if we should use this more in practice? Should we use use both or, or where can you see the one function is better than the other or, or do they complement each other or, or yeah. now I'm thinking about incentives or steering or if you should have specific subsidies for different systems or how, how can you Yes, um, I best way. Yeah, well, I think they are best to consider each other because uh, they show a little bit different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and for Hector, it may be more relevant if you want to, uh, and you need to add maybe uh, what to do with minus, uh, or you can add it yourself to you use that data to be on your own uh, assessment. Mm -hmm. But for the um, yeah, you will listen more to that. Climate impact of that sure, I guess. Mm -hmm. But on this study, I think they should be, yeah. they should complement each other. Mm -hmm. so they should, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, because I was thinking when you showed one of the first slides in the presentation about the biogas really have a really, really good climate performance or really low. <laughs> Emissions and that, that's all always expressed for maybe mm. a few. Then, and I also think about we have this um, greenhouse gas reduction obligation system from Sweden, and, and that's also based on for maybe a few. But as you show here, that it could be one system could be better for EBU. Omega mm -hmm. as a function of it. But if you look at the total reduction mm -hmm. regarding per hectare, mm -hmm. other system could be even better. So you talk about we have a limited amount of land, arable land, mm -hmm. land. So so if we should maximize the greenhouse gas benefit per hectare, mm -hmm. this limited resource. Maybe if we go for omega as so well. Uh, as a functional unit, you can uh, don't reach the, the biggest reduction potential. Mm -hmm. Do you follow? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was thinking about. I think that that's really also I really like in, in your thesis that if we focus too much per mega mm -hmm. as a functional unit, you can miss that per hectare. You can have other systems. Yeah. Like, uh, it's even better mm -hmm. if you look for, from a Uppsala County perspective or Swedish perspective or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think that perspective that you you show it for many of you, but you can also show when you have limited resources, yeah. other land is, mm -hmm. then you can show it up, even though, yeah, that's better for many of you, mm -hmm. we can actually reduce even more if we go for this system, yeah. which a little bit less. Uh, reduction from negative. Mm. Yeah, and I think you can 
And you can also do the, the same thing because I focus on the solar municipality, but it would be interesting to also see the how different and different movements in the region. Yeah, and maybe I just mm -hmm. the whole uh, land uses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's if if you're working with or using residues or or waste or whatever mm -hmm. that is not directly connected to some land. Mm -hmm. uh, then mega you express it for mega is quite fine. I have no problem. But but when when you start to to harvest biomass from from arable land, mm -hmm. is it grass or, or catch crops or whatever? So I think that's also a message that it's uh, it's really good to show the differences mm -hmm. as you do. Yeah. For me, it was really good to mm -hmm. see that. Okay, yeah, but if we should optimize the use of land, then maybe we should have this more relevant to have this function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another message. Yeah. yeah. You should uh, when you talk to policymakers, you should point out that that's important. For you. Yeah, you you showed also um, you have some ideas for future work, mm -hmm. and and um, that was really interesting, and, and you presented it here also. Uh, but there was a you have several different ideas here, so um, if you need to prioritize between them, mm -hmm. should you say that this is number one this this is the most what the important, important thing to to work on now um but i think the, the last point so i said that uh i think all these improved like what the system that can include some of the open as well i think that's important to get the thing now that uh i think that all these be more and more used in different sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, so I see that um, uh, to improve uh, the results and juice technically, uh, so we need uh, methods how to calculate them and different uh, the products. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe not only we are talking about us, but products. Are we talking about? Climate effects or, 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 uh, daily or yeah, I think uh, not mainly, but uh, I think including uh, variable carbon in the way is important. And so, uh, so we have the other carbon and carbon stream and other temporary mm -hmm. uh, cold storage, but also the third um, there are other uh, um, indicators that I think are lacking now, which are very important for. Biodiversity, like biodiversity, mm -hmm. uh, and soil health. And there are some efforts for assessing the um, uh, use of pesticides, for example, but that could also be included. Mm -hmm. um, and also the that uh, let's say there's all product production product focused, mm -hmm. um, and it would be. I think it would be good to if we also could include uh, the other ecosystem service that the airport provides. Because in some cases, you see that when you have a uh, more intense ecosystem, the better the, 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 the impact of the products, and that maybe it's not always uh, good. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that you know, the, the um, interaction between crops. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the uh, when you see a case of uh, the species of crops, you only see that they are the to the crops that Talking about fundraise to to do as you have done here, combine this cycle yeah. ecosystem modeling approaches together with add on to to LCA mm -hmm. additional LCA expanding mm -hmm. approach. 
Yeah. yeah, I think that would be, but maybe for uh, maybe it's not the best approach for every LC practitioner because uh, there will be a lot of LC uh, demand for a lot of LC studies soon, I think. Uh, maybe we need to develop more. And the situation near them and the fermentous oxide and the sensitivity of carbon stock is quite good for it. But they are also high influence of the variation between the sites. Mm -hmm. and it would be possible to, to develop uh, more simple methods to, so that you know, for example, now we have this mean that we have this mean day content. And then you can use that to to better results. Mm -hmm. So we also add the uh, the special. So that the problem when you when you want to have simple. I, I, yeah, I agree. With we we need to have simple simple mm -hmm. methods for for action and so of course. But when when you also talk about this more site specific. Yeah. Yeah, of course. How to, how to handle. And I'm thinking about when you talk about biodiversity, I think that's also very site specific. Yeah. For, mm -hmm. So we have talked a lot about the site specific emissions of nitrous oxide, but the biodiversity is. Um, so is it, you think it's possible to squish, squeeze in everything in the LCA that biodiversity could yeah. be covered in a good way? I think we need to somehow uh, be able to, uh, to address it because that's something that uh, um, the consumers want, I guess. Mm -hmm. you know, the idea is that uh, products will be uh, assessed, the environmental, uh, environmental impact of products will be assessed, let's say, in a mm -hmm. And I think yeah, consumers have a pretty really long picture. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe not that uh, it's possible to do a, a perfect method there, but I think we need to at least something that is somehow relevant for, mm -hmm. uh, to show how the impact of all the biodiversity can produce biodiversity. Is that also due to that we use, as you mentioned, LCA in, in uh, Already today in regulations, etc., for for climate calculations, so yeah. the companies they will use they start to be used to use LCA and they know mm -hmm. about it. And that yeah. it would be they think it would be very convenient to add on biodiversity in the system that they yeah. start to know about. It. I think for them, uh, maybe they use other methods, mm -hmm. but I don't think for this uh, for this moment it would be. A science and the idea there is to have like one score as the environmental impact of it. Mm -hmm. And I think the biodiversity that should somehow be included in that score. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's also possible to, to see biodiversity as like a endpoint indicators. We can use other bit midpoint end indicators to assess the impact of biodiversity. Maybe that's the best way to go, but it would be super specific and assess. Will you continue with that or dig into the Bible? Uh, yeah. uh, I know that uh, the speech lies at the center. Uh, they are working a bit about that, or and uh, to reach to reviews. They have had a couple of workshops. Mm -hmm. so been um, I don't think I uh, probably not focus on that, but I think I will. Uh, Please follow, follow up there. Mm -hmm. So the conclusion is that you have a lot to do yeah. in the coming years with, with yeah. very interesting questions here. Um, no, I, I will uh, just uh, sum up here. I, I think it's, um, as I said in the beginning, it has been a privilege to, to read, and, and I really like, you can really see the development uh about the papers and and the, the last paper i have a lot of questions when i read it and then i come to the last paper and i read the discussion there and then okay 
there is one of my questions <laughs> that you have answered or, or discussed. So, so uh, I really like the I like all the papers, but the last one and especially this discussion of that. Then, then you will really show your increased knowledge you know, that you that you reflect on all most of the world. Very important things to study with course. So once again, congratulations to the English thesis. And I think it's in uh, questions to the members here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. We leave uh, where to the evaluation moving on to start. Thank you, Victor. Uh, this, my friend, is a very nice book. <laughs> Read it, and I've enjoyed it a lot. Very good read. Didn't fall asleep. <laughs> um, I'm a special honor. I believe in LCA when it comes to spatial uh, issues. So I commend you for addressing in your research. So it is very important. Um, let's see here. I'm a little bit interested in your journey. Let's see, there's the top of the page. Yes. Can you, can you give a short summary of what happened? <laughs> From when you started yeah. until you finished your fourth paper. Yeah. Um, so, um, I guess I've said before that um, this problem has worked a lot with uh, the including uh, temporal variation in the um, And we were looking at uh, how we could uh, also include spatial variations. Uh, so, that's what we needed. Um, um, and to do that, as I said before, we need a lot of data. And to get the data, we need some kind of, some kind of model. Um, so then we decided to use the DMC model. Uh, and we, uh, uh, I think it was a big thing for me at least that we got in contact with, uh, with the Canadian team there. Uh, so they helped me with the model. Uh, and then, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the first three papers. And then I actually had a break from my PhD studies for uh, almost one and a half years, I think, um, working for the uh, Institute of uh, And then I came in contact with other LCA people. And I think that broadened my perspective a little bit. Uh, and then I came back, and then we decided to. Uh, to use these uh, big uh, long term digital experiments um, because we thought it would be a nice contrast to the, um, to the modeling studies in the first two papers. Um, and in the last paper, I was going to kind of sum up and do a very traditional LCA study uh, using, yeah, quite traditional methods. That what we were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah. And how how much um, were you able to influence uh, the direction of the research, use of methods? And... Um, well, in the beginning, uh, I was quite decided, I would say, that we were going to go for the DMC, or at least test the DMC model. Because of that, we had some contacts at other departments here at the saloon, but I've worked with that one before. Uh, so they kind of uh, introduced me to that model and said, could we use it? Um, it was quite hard in the beginning, but then when I got in contact with the Canadians, um, they helped me to do that. Um, and then for the, that was the right two paper, and the last two papers, I think I was that. Uh, or three issues which uh methods uh and use. Thank you. Um, I have a very general question it's from the introduction. 
and um, you you claim that the uh, green revolution uh, created environmental impacts, basically. But can't you say also that the green revolution avoided environmental impacts? How do you? Well, we were able to produce a lot more and a lot less land. Yeah. But we were also, we became dependent on more inputs. But it also had, had to go also like that, that it enabled a, a very large uh, population growth. Uh, I guess most of us should be thankful for the green revolution. Um, and so, in that sense, uh, it was a good thing, but uh, we became more dependent on. Uh, I call inputs such as fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers, and pesticides and machines and, and so on. Um, but, and also, I think that the green revolution might have affected the way we are now, the uh, coffee system are we live right now. Um, so we, we became more specialized and uh, only knowing the uh, the crops that the market wants and doesn't really include uh, consider uh, how we kind of uh, find the best uh, uh, coffee system. Thanks. Thank you. Um, methodological question, um, paper two. Um, you created field specific. Uh, data by interpolating uh, national data. <clears throat> um, what was the type of what was the national data? Uh, good question. Um, uh, it was I, I don't exactly remember, but it was some uh, some properties. It was like clay content and sand content and so on, and also the soil uh, again. Carbon, uh, also we have matter, and then some other things as well. But then I use that data uh, to develop more specific uh, soil properties using the in the first sort of paper I used uh, the transfer model and the dissects on the walls, I think. Uh, so you can use that data to develop or to uh, calculate uh, and the meeting point and the capacity and so on. Um, and in the yeah, were they even distributed the sampling points? Uh, good, uh, good question again. I don't really, you know, yeah, it was yeah. a few years ago. Yeah, it's really easy to remember all details. Uh, but what I'm looking for here is that when you did the, the interpolation, are you sure that you've got accurate? How accurate values did you get for each individual field? Because you, you, you interpolate the initial soil organic carbon, soil type, and pH. Mm -hmm. Did you get correct values for each field using interpolation? Uh, well, uh, correct values might be uh, to say, but, uh, and I definitely I don't remember now the interpolation on either, maybe I should. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, this uh, we talked a lot about um, spatial variability. Um, um, so organic carbon, for example, it can vary within a field. So if you do interpolation, you you only get the, the guest value between different measurement points. Mm -hmm. So it's it's um, it's not possible to capture. Really, I mean, it's, it's, it introduces quite a lot of the uncertainty mm -hmm. into the initial results. That's, that's what yeah, I'm yeah. yeah, definitely. So it's a bit problematic um, to use methods like that. But at the same time, it's pretty much you can't do so much. Mm -hmm. uh, or can you? How else can you estimate sort of getting carbon at the field level? You don't use inflation. Um... Uh, increased national points, maybe, or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, about that. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it is very tricky, and it's one of the one of the big challenges. I mean, if we want to be able to to get this um, uh, input data with high spatial resolution, it's uh, it's very tricky because we have this this high spatial variability. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's it's a tricky question and mm -hmm. very, very difficult to answer. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, And then you already talked about you know, simple models. Spatial temporal variation, if we stick with that a little bit, it's the major shortcoming of landscape to, to land use. But what's, what's the limit? Is it relevant? Should we use LCA? Um, should we should should we trust LCA to be able to appropriately consider spatial variations? To, to what extent? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good question uh, because you, you can basically you can do LCA on this level, but maybe that doesn't say very much. Um, so I think, and also think about that in the. In the visit that uh, because now the most LTA practitioners use the most common LTA databases and they have very low spatial, spatial resolution. I think to improve the same results, I think it would be a big thing if we could uh, increase the resolution so we could have like um, LTA data for uh, regions or for smaller areas. Uh, of um, of uh, land, for example, or for, for uh, small regions, um, but then I don't necessarily. I call a lot of things LCA that maybe not everyone calls LCA. I think <laughs> uh, so. I, I think for more traditional LCA people, including uh, too much of spatial temporal variability, would probably. It's something else, I think. It's then you have to do a lot of other work. But I try to keep the, the life cycles thinking in the, in the assessments. I think that's more what I'm referring to. Uh, because I have quite also about that you can have a CFR product, or you can also have a CFR system. And I'm, I'm not sure everyone agrees with, uh, with that. Well, that's uh, how they say should be quite like, like, like that. <laughs> um, I have a few more questions. It's, um, it's too much fun to read. So, uh, uh, you propose that we just that the alternative by my civilization sites are gas, uh, for example, our refineries to reduce the protein concentrate. Uh, I agree with that. But how do you think? If we in your studies, if you would use that for, and if, if you would use the biomass for protein concentrate through a refinery instead of the biogas, through the biogas, how would that affect the climate benefits and also the impact on, on land occupation? Do you have any guess there? Uh, so the, the climate impacts, I, I guess if I use my studies and only uh, change what substituted, I think the uh, substituting fossil fuel cell uh, gives quite uh, good mitigation potential. Uh, so it will probably, so this type of study will probably be a lower uh, mitigation potential if we substitute um, uh, maybe some food or something like that. But if we would go on the, um, yeah, that it depends a little bit how we define your system. And I guess that would be another, I think I would maybe have defined the system a little bit uh, you know, in another way than we put it in my file. And then also, uh, um, what's, um, what's substituted uh, the, the reference system? It also, of course, have a big influence. I think I'll write that, that uh, it's not very realistic, hopefully, that we want to continue to use. Uh, I'm not really here, but continue to use certain systems for this. And hopefully, also the um, impacts from fertilizer manufacturing will be reduced in the future. 
So that's not so the best way would probably to set up the, the restaurant system also to uh, maybe could would also change dynamically over the time. Uh, or have a yeah, I think that would be perhaps the best way to do it. Again, it's a perfect answer <laughs> because um it's when you use a hundred years since we don't have a linear response, so you can call a response to, to changes in land use. Um, it would, uh, having 100 years and then reporting the results on, the, on an annual basis would hide the initial uh, much higher basis, you know. So it's, um, in this figure, you get the soil organic carbon benefits are, are underestimated. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested, especially if you're interested in the short term perspective, which we kind of are, mm -hmm. right? we are kind of interested in, in short term you know, time implication measures. Um, and it also, uh, as you also point out, um, it reduces the need to um, um, to have a more dynamic reference um, system. And the my final question that I'm going to quote is that you state so both in your thesis and in the discussion that it's not such a good idea to include soil organic carbon increases in carbon credit schemes. Mm. But isn't it relevant that farmers are somehow um, credited mm. and compensated for societal benefits? Of course. Uh, but I don't think what I'm thinking that we shouldn't do is to sell credits to uh, companies so they can uh, continue uh, uh, with uh, fossil C2, for example, and then they buy credits which are based on the sort of carbon sequestration. I think that could potentially increase the work element back to the society uh, emissions. So that's um, But yeah, I, you, you, you don't you, you don't have faith in the long term effectiveness of carbon credit um, in this case. Mm -hmm. So how should we do it then? Well, I think that they can have you know, they could be uh, uh, crediting systems, but maybe um, the question is who should pay for it then. Um, and I don't think that's uh, a sustainable scheme that uh, industry can. You get away from uh, reducing their emissions by, by uh, credits from farmers. Who should pay the farmers then for, for the benefits? Um, maybe the government, uh, the taxes, or the, um, that's not very popular either, but uh, increase price to food or something like that. Um, but there, really, there are a lot of subsidies to farmers already, so I guess you could. Uh, use that to, to steer into a more sustainable agricultural system. Basically, the, the public should pay for the services that the benefits that they provide to the public. Uh, and maybe there are other business models that could be implemented, but uh, uh, I haven't uh, heard about them yet. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation, and I would really like to hear this. Uh, I'm thinking about these sites that you used. Uh, how did you choose them? Uh, were they like conscious, or did, were they just available? Or uh, choose them? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, there were more that there are sites that are included in CHA in uh, um, to these experiments, basically. And that's why I haven't. Um, and there are more that there are available, I would say. So do you think that your results are also valid for the rest of Sweden, or is it just those sites, you think? Um, well, I argue that it's important to include spatial variability, so I can't really say that they are uh, valuable for, they are valid for all parts of Sweden, uh, but I guess that you still can use um, some of the results to uh, kind of estimate how we could get the cracking on the as well. Okay. 
Um, but they, these are you know, site specific results. Because so I think, especially when it comes to uh, emission of uh, nitrous gases, that sometimes the organic soils are even more challenging mm -hmm. because they have a lot of microbes there, they produce a lot of nitrous gases. So, how come you didn't include any soils that were really organic? Yeah. Uh, but uh, the easy answer is that, uh, maybe it's not the easy answer, but uh, the, the models that we use are not really developed for organic soils. In the battle for mineral soils. And since you said, as you said, uh, organic soils act quite different compared to mineral soils. And I get the point to do that. You need to develop the model or use these other models. Um, that's why we didn't include them. But uh, they are very important because they make a lot of greenhouse gases. So you talk about underused land. So what, what do you really mean by that? So are they not really in, in agriculture on them today or are they just uh, being well, used at all? It depends a little bit. There are a lot of uh, 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 so it's just being uh, which could be cultivated, but there's also, there also uh, uh, fallow land that I've shown that maybe are taking out of production for a couple of years only to different reasons. Uh, but underuse also mean uh, the cover crop that you can actually cultivate the soil between crops. Uh, there's a potential to increase uh, increase production and uh, soil since they're all already. So you, you talk you mentioned during your presentation that maybe we should eat less I mean meat, for mm -hmm. example, and um, that would help uh, to mitigate climate uh, effects. But but then shouldn't we then grow more food on the land instead? I mean so now you suggest that we should do to grow grass. Isn't that a little bit contradictory? How would that work then? But I think if we if we because now most of the agricultural land is used to produce feed for, for our animals. If we produce meat consumption, I think there will be more uh, land freed up for for cultivating food, but also for energy crops. So do you think that this system would work also more up in northern Sweden, where I mean we used to have these really small agriculture farms, and now they mostly just close down. So would, do you think that this uh, would work even further up north? Uh, well, it's uh, north is famous for growing grass, I think. <laughs> so it should work. Uh, but one challenge there may be to different things, because uh, I've shown in the, in the last figure that one of the biggest missions is on transport. Of, because we need to transport both the biomass, and then you have to transport the, the digestive state to bring it back to the city. That could be a challenge, perhaps, and there are more and there are longer differences between farms in the north. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe that also to a question. No, but that, <laughs> that's I think that's good. Enough. Yeah. So I'm thinking about so whenever you add this slurry to the soil, mm -hmm. I think you have these micro pores sometimes that uh, promote the microbial activity that actually produce nitrous gases. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that could be mitigated with various spreading techniques or mulching techniques. Mm -hmm. Can you look at any different techniques to spread the slurry? Um, no, we didn't. Um, um, it's not. <laughs> we only looked at uh, what's called now, but when it's left, it's quite known. <laughs> um, but it was on the surface. Exactly. It didn't mulch it. No. Longer. No. Because I think it really seriously decreased if you just mulch it down a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, how would this work in practice? I mean, if the farmers would grow this uh, grass, would they like get some contracts with the biogas production plants or how would how this work in practice? Uh, I haven't really looked at that, but. Uh, I think that would be a good uh, idea. Uh, there have been, as far as I know, on some setups like that in southern Sweden, where they had uh, the farms go cross and then they, uh, they sell the cross to a biogas plant and then they get the digestive back. Uh, so I think that could be a good setup. Um, but that's not really my field either. <laughs> 
Do you have any idea? I mean, for this to really make a difference about how widespread would it have to be in Sweden? Would we, I mean, how much land? Do you have any idea that would need to grow this grass for the biogas production? Um, yeah, it depends on how much uh, biogas we want, I guess, but I think it would be kind of to, to, uh, to use more biogas in Sweden uh, for several uh, aspects for reducing climate change, but also for energy security and so on. And so in the Uppsala municipality case, we use 3,000 hectares, it's quite much. But that doubled uh, the biogas production. Um, so, um, but in, uh, yeah, it depends on how much biogas we want, I guess. So, what do you think is the future for biogas? I mean, is there a future for biogas, or are we just switching over to solar panels? Or uh, yeah, well, I think the uh, in the transition to more electricity, I think it would be. It's good for us to use uh, more biofuels like biogas. And then there's also, uh, uh, biogas is also a, a material you can store. Mm -hmm. So it's good to combine in an electricity system where you have a lot of different sources. When the wind is not blowing and the sun is uh, shining, then you can use biogas to produce electricity, for example. And then there's also, uh, uh, for long uh, transports, it could be good to use biogas. You don't have to stop for so long to charge your battery or for uh, the shipping. Speed. I think um, renewable uh, uh, fuels and uh, biofuels will still have a, um, have a position in the future. And I think biogas is also a, a good uh, uh, biofuel because you can take care of waste uh, from maybe the one of also a big thing which we haven't included here, but you can you can you um you can treat the uh, food waste from households and produce biogas. So I think it's it will biogas is still um be with us in the future. Yeah, so, so you think it would be economically feasible also for the farmers to deliver. Uh, well, it's not economically feasible now, I would say. Um, but if we uh, want to have more biofuel, I get the high from the biogas we increase, then it will be more economically feasible in the future. Um, yeah. Okay, so my, my last question. So now, when you are almost done, mm -hmm. so if you look back now, is there anything you would have liked differently? That you would have done if you think no, okay. I should not have done this. So what would that be? Or if you would change anything? We talked a little bit before about uh, the theory unit functioning that I used to take a free. I think it would also be good to uh, maybe add uh, a food unit or something like that in that paper. And um, I've, I've tried now when I would do the kappa to to, to compare different methods, but I think that could also be even being done in a more systemic uh, ways. We put in like a review paper or try different uh, models and so on and compare, really compare. And then I think that would be a big contribution to this field. Um, or maybe that's something in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, last. <laughs> <laughs> seats and trying to find some questions that haven't been asked yet. Um, so uh, thank you for a very nice read. I think uh, the flow in the text is really good. Uh, so it's like the others have said, it's, it's a very enjoyable read. Um, I would like to start a little bit with the LCA method. Would you say that you have done consequential retribution? So, uh, I think I mixed a little bit, <laughs> uh, but the first paper uh, is more uh, attributional, I'll say, uh, I'll say. But I mean, the second one is more consequential because I think uh, the, the change of going from between the future scenarios to the system. 
but I still use uh, a lot of uh, average data. So I haven't used sequential data for all inputs and so on, as we talked about before. Um, so I think I've mixed a little bit actually. Um, what do you think if you would have gone more like full mode consequential? What, what do you think it would mean if you would like to go for like marginal fertilizer production? Yeah, uh, like a marginal reasonable production because that's so. Yeah, um, as we talked about before, like having the, the dynamic reference scenario with paper two. I guess that will also be mean that we would need to imagine the data that I've seen so many times that that would have a high influence. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't really sure right now actually. <laughs> um, I, mean, I guess it would mean like you would have a larger substitution that means because I think the marginal fertilizer. So why would yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and also marginal diesel. There is a huge variability in diesel yeah. impacts as well, which is not shown. Mm -hmm. us, um, that's uh, quite a large variability, mm -hmm. so, which rarely is shown in my guess. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, digestate. Yeah, I mean, you assume that you will use it back on the land again. Mm -hmm. uh, the last larger biogas conference I attended was a lot of talk about digestive, which has changed a lot the last couple of years mm -hmm. um, with the Ukraine crisis and so on, and fertilizer prices shedding. So there was even talk about export market for digestive. So, what do you think about that assumption that you would use it for grass? I mean, would they be able to pay for it? Or would it be others used? Because it, um, it has changed quite a lot in just in a couple of years. Well, uh, in, the, in the second paper, we assume that uh, the DFT is used for the wheat population. And so the DFT is not spread on the grass. Um, but uh, yeah, but we assume, and we think in that paper, we assume that uh, the data is uh, uh, transferred back to the same thing. I guess there you can see that maybe as the farm has some kind of the uh, biogas plant that they have the, um, send the biomass and then turn the tsunami and also uh, the state back. But uh, yeah, and, and when Talking about also spreading the DSA, so we spread it on the graph, it's quite the growing graph, it's quite hard to launch it down. I guess it's better to spread it on, on uh, serial uh, actions. Yeah, and that like, means the possibilities for solar and yeah. economy. Yeah. Uh, so, last one, the time is running. Uh, could you see any broader sustainability effects? Like if you go beyond the environmental impacts, are there any other sustainability effects in society? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe it would increase um, uh, the sustainability of the, uh, the, um, the farmers. Um, I think from the perspective that they can um, grow something that maybe it can increase the value of something that maybe is. For example, if you go and call crops, so you maybe get some subsidies, but also if you can sell uh, the biomass, so it can be like an economic sustainable uh, land. <laughs> um, what color is that? Um, I can see right now, but there are probably a couple. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Did I do any questions? I can go Yeah. Yeah, like everyone said, thank you very much. It was a very uh, nice book. 
Um, and just going a little bit on the LC part here, um, I was just wondering why you chose the methods you chose for everything, but mostly um, such old methods like CML, for example. Um, and like we have the planetary boundaries, I'll say, that looks into biodiversity, for example, and the recipe with Europe that is more, it's closer to us than a site generic specific uh, that is the CML. Um, so well, was it just because? Um, but I think with the CML methods, I think they are, maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they are still one of the use methods to in that space. And for the uh, resource depletion, we use the method and then it, uh, it's uh, included in the environmental and uh, group of indicators. So that's why we use that one. Uh, which is all the, I think that's all the part of the SM, the um, and So we have, <laughs> I don't know if that answer. Yeah, no, just. I have to think to the plan to change the boundaries, say, indicators. Uh, so they are the as the indicators that are making to the plan to change the boundaries. Yeah. Um, so maybe that would be nice to. Yeah, use in the future. Yeah, the planetary boundaries become the impact categories. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, but just um, I, I missed a, a bit more of your uh, LCA detailing sort of for these, for especially these not so common methods like global um, temperature and such absolute. But, um, I think it would have been like interesting for maybe other PhDs that could just have more of oh, how, how do I do this? Because mm -hmm. that's usually uh, a problem um, mm -hmm. for us. So just a bit of spreading out a little bit more. Because mm -hmm. I also missed that on the on your papers. So it's like just your last paper had a supplementary material. It didn't look online if they had, but on, on here, it just the last one had. Yeah. So with more uh, info for other yeah. LCA practitioners in the future. Yeah, uh, I think that could be a good idea. Uh, but uh, so I haven't really developed those methods myself. So uh, I tried to uh, briefly describe them and then I have referred to the other which to describe them in more detail, I would say. And one generic, not uh, I'll say question, but you mentioned very briefly, both in the Kappa and on the presentation, that these could be used in other places. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was just, it was very modest mentioning. So it could have been a mo more developed on the sense like, why, what can we use this for? Mm -hmm. But what kind of characteristics these are the places needed to be to be applicable? Uh, well, when I'm talking about that this method could be used in other regions, I'm referring to like uh, using LCA in combination with hydrogen system modeling, which hasn't really been used that much before. And this combination can be used to to indicate or to find uh, uh, which uh, size, available size in the region are more, most. Uh, and most relevant for certain types of uh, biomass production. Um, so that's why I want to be using some of the But you said something. Uh, what was that answer to you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And we will for the audience. Any questions? It was a very interesting study and also a presentation. So I am curious about the the the, the anaerobic digestion cell. Um, how good feedstock is grass for the biogas process? And uh, also, if the farmers were to grow this, you know that there is a cost to to digest it. 
would they have to pay for it then? Could they, and instead of just using it directly as a feedstock for their animals, for example, if that was like, how do you think about it? And then also like, because the, the biggest, uh, the largest benefit you see for, for producing biogas is the offset from fossil fuels, but we're supposed to, uh, and you, you have done like a hundred year estimations, but we're supposed to reduce fossil fuel use as soon as possible. How, how would it change? Like, is it valid to make that offset? Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, goals as feedstock. Okay. It shows quite uh, high methane potentials, potential. So I, I think it's a quite well, in that sense, it's a quite good feedstock. Um, but it's not possible to digest uh, only uh, grass the register. So you have to use some kind of coal digestion. So you have you mix with different types of feedstocks. And, and when you do that, I don't think it's a problem to digest uh, grass. Um, and yeah, we, yeah, so um, I agree that uh, we should focus on reducing the emissions of forest, but there will be, and to do that quicker, I think we need to provide some kind of uh, alternative. Um, and uh, as yeah, so we also discussed that before, but uh, it's not very realistic to, um, to say that. Well, not very optimistically is to say that we will continue to use to sell of fossil fuel for 100 years. But uh, uh, and that would have been better to use a more dynamic reference scenario. But in this paper, we also want to show uh, how the climate impact of the subject can could vary over time. And so that's why we, we used them 100 years. And there are, yeah, it could be improved, of course, but uh, that's why how we did it. Probably would have done it in a long way, but it's fake. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have a question? No? Okay. So, thank you very much for the very nice discussions. And we have both the government and the museum. Malaysian committee. So by this, I will close this session and then we will reconvene up at our department and then we will close for a final. So thank you very much. <laughs>